I'm Dr. Charlie Fuchs, and I lead hematology, oncology, product development at Genentech and Roche, and I'm speaking to you today from the 2024 European Society of Medical Oncology meeting here in beautiful Barcelona, Spain. And I am very privileged to be joined today by Professor Luis Pasares, who is the leader of medical oncology at Hospital Universitario in Madrid, Spain. Luis, great to see you. Let me ask you, how are you feeling about ESMO this year? I'm really enthusiastic, really. You know, this time of the year when the ESMO meeting is coming, the same happened to us. I'm really get enthusiastic about what is new there. I'm really getting passionate about the new data. Particularly new data is what is driving me to come here. Of course, you also have good opportunities to see your friends, to connect with people you work with. And finally, it's a great opportunity also to start new collaborations, new projects with uh, some other investigators, with industries. I suppose you had the same feeling. You have been working in the clinic for a number of years. Now you're on the pharma side. What is your expectation here from a meeting like that? Yeah, you know, it, it hasn't really changed whether I was at Harvard or Yale or Genentech and Roche. You know, I think for me, the great thing is to interact with extraordinary leaders like yourself and as well just to step away from the usual routine, come here and really sort of energize creatively. That is, think about new things and, and hear about new ideas and talk to great people and you leave here really feeling refreshed as what's the next thing I want to work on. And you cannot miss these opportunities. So it's great to be here at ESMO. So Luis, let me ask you something, you know, given your expertise and experience, what do you see as the biggest and most urgent challenge we now face in oncology? Maybe one of the more important ones is trying to really uncover the biology of many diseases, of many cancers, and that will help us to really get uh, truly transforming therapies. We have seen that, that uh, 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 when we understand some biological mechanisms that is really having influence in cancer, we easily turn back. Second thing is about uh, having those novelties, this innovation, having everyone having access to that. At some point, there is quite an inequity in the way that uh, cancer care is delivered. I don't know, this is a very difficult challenge. I think this is likely out of our scope, but I think we should all together collectively do something about that. Yes. The last thing maybe I mentioned not to be here for, a, for, for two hours would be a prevention. I mean, we know that risk factors are uh, very important. We do not do a, still everything about that. In my country, still nearly 30% of the population is smoking. This is unbelievable. It's a, it's a big issue. So Charlie, we have mentioned a number of challenges. So what would be the thing that uh, you're really willing to solve in oncology today? What would be that thing that will make you really, really happy? Yeah, well, let me just say, I don't think I could beat your answer. And you, I think we both agree that it's hard to come up with one thing. There's so many opportunities that we have to tackle. Um, and I just randomly pick one, which is immunotherapy. And you know, in lung cancer, it's been uh, miraculous, right? But we have to do better than just the current checkpoint inhibitors. And that's not been easy, right? And hopefully, to your point, as we better understand biology, come up with new targets, we'll get there. So understanding the biology, the uh, molecular abnormalities that are underlying cancer is essential for diagnosis, to improve the therapeutics, and uh, uh, to really help patient outcomes. What can we do to really uh, make that uh, into new solutions to patients? Yeah, I think it's, it's such a great point, and I really appreciate, Luis, your focus on we have to understand the underlying biology to really make advances. We can't simply take drugs off the shelf. You know, I, I think a couple of things. One is, in light of our discussion about immunotherapy, what 
is the explanation for resistance, right? Why do some patients not respond at all? And why do some respond then stop? And if we can understand that resistance mechanism, maybe together we find the next great treatment for lung cancer. And I would say as well, may there be lung cancer or other things, how do we replace chemotherapy? I mean, you know, platinum-based chemotherapy, is, it's good. It's been around a long time. How do we get rid of that, yeah. right? And that's not easy because it works. But I think we got to understand what is the next therapy that gets rid of that altogether. So, Luis, let me ask you a, a tough question, which is, how do you envision that we will be treating cancer in the future? Okay, that's uh, not an easy one, but uh, what I think is that we will have uh, a lot better idea. We will do a more comprehensive study of the patient. We really uh, will understand better his health, comorbidities and everything. We will study in depth the tumor, not only two or three genetic traits, but many others, the immune landscape. So and with all that information, we will try to get a tailored uh, trajectory of treatment for that individual patient. That is what I think. And we will use surgery for sure, but likely less radical surgery. We will use chemo, but likely less and less chemo, and chemo will be more often used as a late line. We will use more immunotherapy, more novel targeted therapy, including ADCs, biospecifics, we will use radio label drugs. We will use uh, cell therapeutics, personalized cell therapeutics. And all together, I would think, hopefully, the outcome will be a lot better for the patients. What type of innovations do you think uh, you will be able to, to, to take forward uh, uh, into the future? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think we both agree there's a lot more work to be done, but I'm optimistic for the future. I think there's a lot of interesting modalities emerging. You know, we are finally figuring out how to, how to, how to really leverage cytokines in a way that might be tolerable and maybe be part of immunotherapy. You know, the bispecifics, which have been great in, in the setting of hematologic malignancies, I think we're starting to figure out how to do this in solid tumors and maybe some form of lung cancer and, and maybe beyond. You know, radio ligands, I know, you know, radiotherapy is a mainstay and, and clearly those things may emerge going forward. And, you know, cancer vaccines, which have been studied for centuries, but clearly we just have to keep pushing these modalities, understanding the biology and, and ultimately deliver the promise of better therapies for patients. Luis, you know, one topic that is in just in common parlance is artificial intelligence, but it's obviously part of what we do. And, you know, one thing I'm really proud of at Genentech and Roche is, is leveraging artificial intelligence to better select drugs, to improve our prediction of drugs that we should be putting in the clinic. We have something called lab in a loop, which is you do a few experiments and you can leverage that, just recycle the data to really inform a variety of new targets and new indications and new scientific paradigms. And I, I think it will ultimately speed up the pace of progress. But let me ask you, whether it be the area of research or frankly delivering clinical care, where do you see AI going here? Well, I think there are, uh, I mean, a number of opportunities here. If you look at this Congress, you realize uh, there are, uh, in every session, nearly a touch, a flavor of uh, artificial intelligence. I was surprised this year at the ACR also, plenty of that. Just one example, last week at the, uh, at the San Diego meeting, you know, we have been seeing that uh, with ADCs, expression of the target is not typically a predictive factor. So, it, I mean, there, yes, there was a presentation where using computational pathology as a way of determining by density the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the presence or not of this uh, target protein and that was hugely uh, a, a predictive. was not prognostic, but it was really, really very predictive. So the question is, are we going to be able to reproduce those data in the clinic? Is that easy to reproduce everywhere? 
We don't know yet. We have to validate those data, but I think those are great. Uh, I mean, we, great momentum to see if we are able to take opportunity to, to take advantages of uh, all those opportunities. That's a great example, and it's exciting. Absolutely. So, Luis, a, a final question. You know, patients need new therapies today, and clinical trials take a long time. They're inefficient, they're costly. How do we do it better? How do we get to the space of innovative trial designs? Well, I think is, that is a very important question. We have to be more efficient. For that, maybe something relevant would be trials should answer questions relevant for patients and not necessarily questions that are important for agencies. But when you have, for example, an oncogene addicted disease, that is where patients had a disease defined genetically, heterogeneity is not quite there, right? So I think we could do like singular trials. We have to use a lot more registry data, real world data. We have to share from this amount of data these are out there. Of course, transition from phase one to phase three trial has to be quicker. We have to, for that, use also the collaboration with uh, uh, academia, and I think uh, there is a, a great point now to really uh, uh, foster this uh, collaboration between pharma and uh, uh, public or academic uh, cooperative. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and uh, what a great point to end our conversation, which is the importance of the academic industry partnership so that we collectively deliver for patients. So thank you for this conversation today.